Um, and All right. we are gonna get, I believe, Gigi Sohn up here in a minute. She's uh, actually a former aide at the FCC uh, and a distinguished fellow at Georgetown Law. Uh, we've also got um, Ron still there on the Hill uh, who can explain a little bit uh, more about what's going on with the petition delivery. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna keep this epic all day live stream going. It's been pretty epic so far. Uh, and uh, we're gonna just keep delivering you all uh, important content and news uh, throughout the day so that we can keep driving phone calls and emails to the Senate um, and making sure that they know people are, are talking and caring about this. Yeah, and th so thank you very good. much, Evan. <laughs> awesome, thanks for being here. See you later. All right, and Joe, holler at me if we're ready to go to Gigi uh, or otherwise, maybe we can go back to Ron on the Hill. Um, but oh, Gigi's on her way. Great, Gigi is Just on the way. But this will be. This is going to be a really good moment for folks who have questions to ask us questions because Gigi Stone is one of the uh, preeminent experts on this issue. Uh, she knows the deep policy on it probably better than almost anyone else out there. Um, so uh, definitely, uh, you know, get ready with some questions in the chat uh, for Gigi because um, she's going to be able to answer them. Uh, possibly better than almost anyone else we're going to have on the stream today. Gigi, I see you there. How's it going? Good, good. I don't see myself, though, and I love to look at myself, so what's going on? I mean, I understand. You know, you've got rad glasses. <laughs> How do I look? Do I look good? You're looking great. Looking great. Excellent. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> cool. I like the blazer. Um, Thank you. So... So Gigi, we've been going since this morning. We were just uh, down on uh, in the Senate building with the folks that are delivering 3.5 million signatures to Mitch McConnell. Um, and you know, in a little bit, we'll be going to the Senate floor. Um, and you know, I asked Sarah Morris about this this morning, but you know, I, I'll bring up you know uh, Nathan Lemer or Lerner or what, whoever he is over. Lemer, Nathan, yeah, Nathan Lemer, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, he's he's kind of subtweeting me here. I tweeted about our live stream, and you know, he's sort of saying, oh, you know this epic all day live stream is, you know, going on the free and open internet. So like, what's the problem? Which I keep saying like, this is basically the tech policy equivalent of like, it's snowing outside, therefore climate change can't be real. Um, <laughs> but, you know, unpack this for us, Gigi. Here we are a year after the FCC repeal going into effect. The internet obviously still exists. So, you know, why, why should we still care? And why is this a, a disingenuous talking point coming from the other side? Yeah. So, look, I think there's when people talk about net neutrality and particularly people who are not our friends, they focus on the prohibition against blocking, throttling and paid prioritization. Uh, but the repeal of the 2015 open Internet order, which I worked on when I was at the FCC, is a lot more than that. Uh, there has been some research done actually showing that some of the Internet service providers are actually throttling Netflix and YouTube and, and, and other uh, video applications. But I think in some ways that almost misses the point. What's, what was most important about what we did in 2015 was that we grounded the rules in the strongest legal authority under the Communications Act of 1934. And that is the law that regulates communications networks in this country. And by doing that, we restored the FCC's responsibility to protect consumers and competition when it comes to broadband. So let's say one day Comcast decided to triple your prices. Uh, shouldn't there be a cop on the beat who determines that that's not just or reasonable? Or if, for example, and this is ripped from the headlines, uh, mobile carriers, let's say like at and and T-Mobile and Sprint decide to sell your precise geolocation information to data brokers who then send it to bounty hunters who can find domestic uh, violence victims and others, uh, you know, with like the snap of their fingers, shouldn't there be an agency that says that's not cool, AT&T, Sprint, and T-Mobile? Well, that's what we restored in 2015. And what Ajit Pai has taken away again is that responsibility. He has said the FCC, the agency that was created in 1934 to protect consumers and competition when it comes to access and networks, will now have no responsibility, will completely abdicate its responsibility when it comes to the most important network of our lifetime. So I think if you focus on who's minding the store, who's making sure that Comcast and AT&T and Verizon and Charter are not 
you know, defrauding you, uh, you know, billing you for things that you don't want to be billed for, uh, that they are not, again, raising prices willy-nilly. There's nobody right now who will do that. And that's really, to me, what's important uh, about, about the 2015 Open Internet Order and why it's important through the Save the Internet Act to reinstate that order. I think that's so important to underscore, Gigi, because, you know, one of the things we've realized is that net neutrality, you know, I mean, we'll quote the Beatles here. It's like net neutrality is more popular than Jesus at this point, right? I mean, it's like <laughs> everybody um, supports this concept and that's made it so that, you know, uh, the telecom lobbyists and the politicians that they more or less own, you know, they're not going around anymore saying things like, oh, we're against net neutrality. They know they basically can't say that. So now everyone, you know, Comcast and AT&T, who've spent hundreds of millions of dollars lobbying to destroy net neutrality, are out there saying, we love net neutrality. We love a free and open internet. We just want to do it this other way, um, which is likely what we will hear, I will assume, um, from, you know, whether it's Roger Wicker or, you know, whoever uh, the, the telecoms kind of put up to the task of denying this unanimous consent request later today. I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they say, look, you know, we've got these great proposals coming, uh, you know, from Republican lawmakers. Uh, let's let's find a bipartisan compromise and get this ping pong match over and get this done once and for all. Um, so can you explain that a little bit to folks, Gigi? Why are they wrong? You know, why shouldn't we uh, work out a compromise that just, you know, so that we can get this done with and, and move on to the next thing? Well, first of all, I think it's interesting that in the House, there were three different Republican proposals. So even they can't agree on what net neutrality is, okay? But, but to simplify it as much as possible, most of them say, okay, your internet service provider can't block, it can't throttle, they don't all agree on paid prioritization. So for, for those of maybe who are not listening, when I say paid prioritization, I mean that a Google or a Hulu pays the internet service provider an extra fee to get to the customer faster or, or with better quality of service. So if you're a small video provider, let's say like a Vimeo, um, and you can't afford to pay that, you're going to get to the customer slower. All right. So, so number one, there's not even an agreement on what we would call the bright line rules. But let's just say for shits and giggles that there is a, a, an agreement on that. What none of those bills has is restoring the FCC's authority to protect consumers and competition and to promote broadband competition, which leads to greater broadband access. You know, there's almost universal agreement that the FCC's uh, determination that all Americans are getting uh, broadband to them in a in reasonable and timely basis is just nonsense. And this is Republicans, Democrats, everybody. Microsoft has done a study showing that 160 million Americans are not getting broadband. Well, Who's in charge of promoting that? Nobody right now, because the FCC has given up that authority. So real net neutrality must restore the federal communications ability to protect consumers and competition, whether it's price gouging or privacy or fraudulent billing, or you name it, name your favorite, you know, or your least favorite practice from your internet service provider. Right now, there's nobody minding the store. And we've seen, you know, there was probably the most notorious example of where that's gone wrong over the last year was in California yeah. uh, with Verizon, uh, you know, throttling and then trying to charge double to lift their cap on firefighters that were battling some of the worst wildfires in California history. And I know, Gigi, you wrote a little bit about that and explained why, yes, in fact, this has everything to do with net neutrality yes. uh, and particularly with. Uh, the removal of the general conduct standard, um, you know, that was repealed along with everything else uh, when Agi Pai basically, uh, you know, pulled the lever on uh, the rules that uh, millions of people from across the political spectrum fought for and won back in 2015. And Gigi, you know, it's worth saying, I mean, you were inside the FCC back when we were flooding you all with phone calls and emails from millions of people. You know, so, you know, you know, as well or better than anyone that this is something that people deeply care about. Um, 
But can you, you know, share with us, t tell us more about that incident with the Verizon firefighters and how uh, without these rules in place, we're gonna see more incidents like that and how this is actually something that impacts um, not just uh, how fast we can watch videos or where we can get content online or the internet economy, but also our public safety. Yeah, before I do that though, I do wanna thank everybody out there and thank you, Evan, for all the work, Fight for the Future and Demand Progress and Free Press have done bringing the American people to these issues. I I've been doing this work for 30 some odd years. I started off doing media concentration uh, and then kind of morphed to the internet and I've never seen anything like it and it's fantastic and it's because of you. And trust me, I was getting 11 o'clock phone calls so the chief of staff of the FCC saying, make it stop. And you did it and, and, and we did it, we all did it and we got to get it back and it's really, really important. But let me talk about California. When, when a person like Nathan Lemer, who, you know, we're frenemies, uh, says, well, nothing bad has happened in the years since uh, the net neutrality repeal went into effect. You mentioned two things. You mentioned what I mentioned before, the carriers selling precise geolocation to data brokers, which then went to bounty hunters for like $300, like some ridiculous price. And you mentioned what happened in Santa Clara County. So what happened there was uh, the Santa Clara County Fire Department was fighting the biggest, at that time, the biggest ever uh, uh, fire, the Mendocino Complex fire. And they need their broadband connection to coordinate with other public safety officials, with volunteers, with whoever, to coordinate response. Well, you know, they were getting throttled and they immediately engaged in a, in a conversation with Verizon over seven months. Seven months, Verizon refused to stop the throttling even though they were in the midst of this major fire. And finally Verizon said, well, if you pay us more than double of what you've been paying for before, uh, what you've been paying before, we'll stop the throttling. And that's what they did. Well, why is this about net neutrality? It's about net neutrality for two reasons. The first reason is the, the, the fire department had no place to go. I, I mentioned before how when Pi repealed the 2015 open internet order, he abdicated his responsibility overseeing the broadband market. So the fire department, if they went to the FCC, which they didn't, and by the way, the FCC didn't even say anything about this after it happened, and still haven't over a year after it happened, uh, they had no recourse. They, they couldn't go to the FCC because the FCC would say, well, we don't have you know, authority over broadband, sorry. They couldn't go to the FTC either because the FTC really only looks at like things like fraudulent you know, uh, whether you're basically being fraudulent or you're misstating something. They don't look at whether a, a, a company, a broadband provider is acting in an unjust or unreasonable fashion. So, so that's number one, is, is the removal of authority gave this fire department absolutely nowhere to go, so they had to negotiate and eventually lose to Verizon. Number two, the net neutrality rules that were repealed had something called the general conduct standard. And that standard said that if an ISP is, um, is unreasonably interfering with a uh, you know, content provider or any speaker's ability to get to other speakers, then the FCC will make a determination whether or not that's, again, unjust and unreasonable. Uh, so one could very well argue that at a bare minimum, this could have been a violation uh, of the general conduct standard. But the larger point is, again, the firefighters had nowhere to go. And here's the other thing that I hear a lot. And this actually, there's a court case about net neutrality that's going on right now. We were almost afraid we were going to get a decision today. Thank God we didn't because there's a lot of other stuff going on. And even the judges said, well, couldn't you have just bought a fatter pipe? Couldn't you have just, what's wrong with you having to pay more for more connectivity? That's not the only problem. The other problem is that ordinary citizens are also using their internet connection to connect to the fire department. So, you know, this really is when, like I said, when anybody says, well, nothing bad has happened, you use those two examples I use, and those are bad examples. Uh, and again, those are the only the two we know about. Sorry, I was taking myself a minute. <laughs> to you, but, you know, I think, th I mean, those are, you couldn't ask for better examples than those, you know, I would say. And, you know, and then, and you're absolutely right that we don't know 
what else is going on because there's nobody, you know, there isn't an agency right now that's paying attention to it. You know, the, you're essentially saying, if I'm understanding right, that the FCC isn't do, doing their job. Um, and we're, you know, basically our task right now is to try to get Congress, who essentially is the FCC's boss, uh, to make the FCC do their job. And it, this is a good moment to remember that we are Congress's boss. They work for us. They are our elected officials. And so, you know, here we are today, and, and I know, you know, we've explained a little bit to our viewers about the unanimous consent request that's, that's going to happen. Um, but, you know, what would your message be, Gigi, especially for Republican senators who, you know, really, in my opinion, can't afford to be on the wrong side of this issue that the overwhelming majority of Republican voters uh, support that really impacts people in rural areas? You know, a lot of the folks that you would, you know, we just, just before you came on, we had a U.S. Army veteran talking about why this matters so much to U.S. veterans and service members. Um, you know, you would think this would be, you know, this is about competition and innovation. This should be a bread and butter Republican issue. Um, so, you know, why, why is this, you know, playing out partisan in Washington, D.C.? And what should folks who are out there watching do today to try to push this forward? What's kind of the path forward for restoring net neutrality? Yeah, I doubt I'm going to sh sh shock anyone when I say this is all about money. Uh, and you have, you know, you have the broadband companies who give unbelievable amounts of money, uh, both to Republicans and Democrats, but probably more to Republicans. And the Republicans tend to, you know, they believe in this so-called free market mantra, although we're not talking about a free market here. And we're talking about regional monopolies, and that ain't a free market. Uh, I think it's really about money. But I, I will say that I have found that, you know, constituent pressure beats money. It doesn't always happen right away, but it happens eventually. And I'm, I'm definitely seeing this issue become an election issue along with broadband access. And, and you asked me before, you know, what's the message to, uh, to, to, you know, red state senators or, you know, rural senators. And that is, do you want an agency that's actually filling those gaps that your constituents are complaining about? You know, it, I, I just from anecdotally know that there are there were dozens of congressional races and several Senate races and governor races where access to broadband was a top three issue. And my argument to them is, unless you restore the FCC's uh, authority along with net neutrality, there isn't anybody who's going to take responsibility for making sure that your constituents have broadband. That would be my main argument. No, I think that's so important, Gigi, because we, you know, we're seeing again, you know, the telecom lobbyists on their side are trying to present this as uh, sort of a false decision. Either, you know, either you can expand broadband uh, and make get more people on the internet, or you can have net neutrality. Um, and the reality is that that's just a total joke. And and for people who only have one or two service providers in their area, net neutrality becomes even more important because they're completely at the mercy of that provider. If that provider decides. You know, we're a rural provider in Alaska and we don't want to allow uh, Netflix because they broadcast Queer Eye on our network. They, there's nothing currently legally preventing them from making that decision. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. And again, the FCC is supposed to be responsible for promoting competition. I do have to say one other thing, and I, I hope Nathan is watching. I love you, Nathan. Um, the chairman put out a statement yesterday, I think the anticipation of this one year anniversary. Uh, talking about how, you know, investment in broadband has increased since, you know, in the last two years, code since we repealed uh, the, net, the open internet order. And, you know, everything's wonderful. And look at our broadband deployment report, which said that more Americans are getting broadband. I've got a couple of responses to that. Is number one, he obviously hasn't read uh, the trade press that said, Charter, Comcast, Verizon, and now AT&T have all said that they are investing less in their networks. Uh, again, I don't think either the rules as we set them up or the repeal had anything to do with investment, but to the extent that the chairman tied his entire argument for repealing the rules and the FCC's authority on, you know, that, it's, that, that the rules somehow hurt investment, and the companies proved him wrong and very, very quickly. The other thing I think does bear repeating, the FCC has a no idea, the federal government has no idea who has broadband in this country. 
And the way that we measure broadband is so poor uh, as to, again, you know, Pi stated, oh, tw only 21 million, which is still a significant number of Americans don't have access to broadband. As I said before, Microsoft, using a more scientific method, found that eight times more than the FCC said don't have broadband. So again, do you want an expert agency? And look, the FCC is not perfect. Now, I've been doing this work for 30 years, and I've spent a lot of time criticizing the FCC. But better to have somebody minding the store than just letting these companies do what they want. And that is the state of play right now. Your Comcast, your Verizon, your Charter, your AT&T could pretty much manage their networks whatever way they want. Uh, and what you want, who cares? And that's, and that's the way it is right now. And I think that's why we need to pass this bill. And, you know, Senator McConnell, the Grim Reaper, needs to do what 85% of Americans on a bipartisan basis want him to do. And that's reinstate the 2015 Open Internet Order through the Save the Internet Act. Well, that seems like just the perfect place to wrap it up, Gigi. Thank you so much uh, for joining us with your expertise and, um, you know, and just for all the work you've been doing on this for, for decades. I mean, it's, you know, we, we wouldn't be here without you and uh, it's an honor to have you on. We've got Craig Aaron on deck uh, from Free Press. So another one of our friends in the building. And I guess last word, Gigi, to the folks who are out there uh, watching, you know, what should they do? What should they do today um, to make their voices heard? Look, you know, fight for the future, free press, demand progress. They all have the battle for the net. They have easy tools to let your senator know that this is important to you. And this is something that you vote on. This is something you care deeply about. And you'll vote their butts out of office if they don't, you know, uh, vote for this bill. So, look, you know, it's going to work. It may not work this time, this month, next month, but it's eventually going to work. And we're, we're going to get net neutrality and FCC authority back. But it's going to take a lot of patience. Like I said, I've been doing this work for over 30 years. And, you know, if I was looking for a short-term fix, I would have jumped out a window by now. So it's a long slog. But if it's important enough to you, you will weigh in again and again and again. And we'll be here to celebrate. We'll all celebrate together when we get net neutrality back. Well, I'll raise my seltzer to that, Gigi. Uh, <laughs> Uh, just one of the you know nation's leading experts on this issue and all around boss and uh, distinguished fellow at Georgetown, among many other hats and titles that I know he wear, Gigi. But uh, thanks so much for being on with us. And